So this is actually the entrance of Bampan village. So you can see, uh, I can turn it around. They actually have a little, uh, let's see, they actually have a little checkpoint because these, this is one of the very uh, famous villages. All the famous villages here, they all have uh, some kind of checkpoint to prevent people bringing teas from outside uh, to the village and sell it off as the village tea, which is very common practice, believe it or not. A lot of the big factories, that's what they do. Uh, the villagers hate them because uh, they set their factory in the village, but they never really buy the teas from the village. And then they uh, have people bringing the tea in the village, and then they send their customers here. Oh, oh shit! Ah, it's so bumpy. <laughs> My head got caught between the window and the and the the, the door ledge. Ah, oh, it hurts. So, uh, so and then they they uh, they sell it off uh, just because the tea went out from the village. The finished tea, and then they were able to sell it for for the big price. But it's actually not the leaves from the village. So one thing we learned today is that pigs do not eat tea leaves. <laughs> so wherever there's bamboo, I said I should say wherever there's tea, there's always bamboo. Bamboo and tea are like best friends. And wherever there's uh, bamboo, the water is always the best. So now I want to introduce to you a very useful tool here in tea, tea country. It's basically a relatively big bamboo basket with a little uh, uh, shoulder rest. And then uh, this thing goes on to my head. Uh, you see a lot of older, uh, older people wearing this. It's really steep here, by the way. Uh, so it's like, it's like this. See, goes on my head and like this. And then I can walk really long distance like this. It's really fun. <laughs> so uh, remember I was saying that good tree grows in mountains and uh, grows among other trees. Remember poor trees, so these are all tea trees. Uh, these are leftovers from uh, organized tea activities back in the Ming and Qing dynasty. Uh, so if you we take a uh, bird eye view from the top, uh, it basically, uh, you can totally tell that this is uh, uh, organized cultivation. Uh, it forms uh, straight lines and things like that. However, uh, the activity was abandoned. Uh, largely abandoned uh, by the end of uh, Qing Dynasty and then got picked up again in recent years. So this give us a rare opportunity. Wow, this is big. This is a really big tea tree. I think this is bigger than the... This, we're still in Laobanjang of Bulang Mountain. Uh, I think this is much bigger than the, the other ones we saw, uh, the Qing tea tree. Yeah, this is much bigger than that one. Uh, so that's what poetry basically give us a rare opportunity to uh, sample what the age of tea tree has to offer for the taste of the tea. Uh, this is beautiful. Uh, I'm gonna just get closer and then put my foot on the trunk to give you a uh, reference point. See, it's giant. Tea trees are very, very sturdy. Like I can sit on this with no problem. Uh, it's not uncommon to see more than three people on one tea tree taking tea at the same time. So, like this one, we have one bud and one leaf. These are still kind of young. When you make poor, you don't want the leaves to be too young. Um, but this will be very good for, for red tea. See now, they have the tiny leaf, tiny, but they probably want to wait until this one become a, like this big to pick it. Uh, it's not budding very evenly this year. Mm -hmm. There were a few days ago, this tree was uh, like this region, the bud was too tiny, so they didn't come back and check. Yesterday, it was raining. When they didn't come back, it, a lot of the trees already grow older, and that's always what the farmers worried about the most. And also, realize these. These are basically dry moss, and uh, if you take it off and smell them, smell them uh, this smell which is kind of like a very dry wood fishy smell uh, this is considered very much preferred in tea uh, usually only tea trees that are older has this 
grow on it, and it gives the tea that kind of, kind of fishy flavor to it. Um, not not like fish, super fishy. But it's like a metallic fishy. I don't know if that makes sense. Sometimes if you uh, rub iron, rub some metal, it gives off like that kind of metallic uh, fishy flavor. Uh, this is what gives tea. Uh, some of the uh, for some teas, I mean, with the making technique, sometimes you can go make this flavor go away. But because it's preferred, it's almost like the oaky flavor of uh, of wine. Uh, some people extremely preferred this, and for those people, they were willing to pay top price for for this uh, particular taste. Mm -hmm. That's all the so when we pick the tea, you want to have one bud and two leaves. Uh, sometimes it's uh, three leaves, that's fine too, as long as it's tender. The importance is to feel how tender it is versus, uh, uh, see this one is a little too small, uh, but if we don't pick it, it's going to be too late later. Uh, and for this one, for example, it has one bud and one leaf, and that's fine. Uh, that was a bad demo for this one. See, it has one bud and one leaf, and that's that's okay. Because yeah. some are more tender, some are less tender. Some have like a, one bud and three leaves, and that's fine too. Tea. Uh, tea when they're, they're very tender, uh, when you stir fry it, they're gonna curl up, and then we further roll the tea. So it's very tight uh, string. However, the older leaves will become like this. It wouldn't curl up. See, on this one, um, uh, one, one tea strand, there's actually a tender part, which actually is a bud, and then this is the older part. Sometimes when you're picking it, it's not, it, you can't just feel it completely by hand. And like this one, that's also why uh, when we're picking the tea, it's, it's, it's not wise to uh, go strictly with one but two leaves or one but one leaf because every tea leaf, just like people, is different. So this one has only one bud and one leaf, but this one leaf is actually too old. After the tea finished making, it's, it's true color is finally shown. So you can see that it's actually uh, a yellow leaf. So we need to pick out the yellow leaf. Now before this step takes place, the tea is called rough tea. So sometimes uh, when people come to tea, a tea drunk, and they were asking, uh, what is the rough tea? Rough tea basically means the tea that haven't been uh, went through the final refining process yet. And picking the yellow leaf is one of the most important steps of picking, um, of making, uh, of refining the tea. Also, uh, this is uh, can give us a glimpse of the actual quality of the tea. So even though if you don't know anything else about tea, if you, people present you uh, a batch of tea, plenty of the yellow leaves, or the stamps. Stamps is also another uh, thing uh, we need to pick out, the stamps. That means the people who make the tea or who sold the tea or did not care about enough about their tea to do to go through the refining process. Usually it's because the labor cost exceeds the, the cost of the actual tea. So that's not a good batch of tea. So it really, uh, so, so even though it's not a direct telling of the quality of the tea, but usually that tells the quality of the tea, if that makes sense. This is a little trick, because for all uh, true origin teas, this is a necessary step. You can see that basically uh, the more expensive the tea is, the more uh, incentive there is for the tea makers uh, to, to refining the tea. Uh, so this is the Lao Banjiang. In uh, Bulangshan, now this is uh, some of the most expensive pours. I want to show you what is called the opposite leaves, which is not tired. This is the opposite leaf. As you can see, the butt is super tiny. It's not coming out. Oops. <laughs> it's right here as the butt. Normally, the leaves, remember the fat butt. See, these are the two leaves, and there's a giant butt in the middle. So, some of the years, uh, any tree that has a little bit of this is okay. But some trees has a lot of the opposite leaves. And some years, uh, that's just a particular bad year. Uh, basically, these are like malnutrition uh, tea trees. So you can tell, it's very telling in the, uh, uh, the brute leaves as well. So if you see uh, a tea with lots of the opposite leaves, uh, it is not desired. See how pretty they are. Um, so this is, uh, we're almost at Guafengjai. Guafengjai is one of the top village of uh, Yiwu Mountain. Uh, if you drink pu'er, uh, you 
probably have heard of Iwu. It's definitely one of the most sought after uh, Puerto Mountains. Um, so here's some truth about Iwu. Now, uh, Iwu back in Qing Dynasty, um, Iwu, I would say out of all the tea mountains was the most famous uh, tea mountains. However, uh, later there was the decline of the poor teas and uh, in recent years there we see the renaissance of poor. Of course, tons of the uh, tea makers, tea buyers, they all flood into uh, Yiwu Mountain again. So what happened around the poor bubble time was that tons and tons of the um, old trees were actually cut down and the people replanted with the plantation teas or the small tea trees. So even though this is very much at the center of Yiwu Mountain, uh, it's true origin, but it, a lots of them, lots of places already lost the very essence of what made this, uh, the, the tea here so uh, famous in the first place. So there's still lots of the old trees uh, left in this region. However, the chance of um, getting an Iwu, but it's actually a plantation tea or a small tea, is very, very uh, great. Uh, second attempt today to uh, stir fry the teas. Uh, this is a brand new batch. It's about five to six kilos in here. Uh, the reason I'm stir frying this batch is because uh, this is a new batch, so the temperature is relatively lower. My chance of messing it up is a little lower. Uh, the batch I was doing earlier was uh, it was quite chaotic. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, it's getting burned. <laughs> this is uh, this is a little more leisure life. So remember, poor. Uh, the reason it's classified as a green tea is because it basically follows a very typical green tea uh, making technique. Uh, you basically just stir fry the tea. I feel like I'm getting better at this. I was supposed to have a bit of a hot ass in our gap. So, uh, it's, um, so the key is to basically flip the tea so it doesn't get burned on the bottom because over here is where the temperature is the highest. And I need to drop it towards the, the high point, and that's when it gets cooled down and slide down. So now I want to showcase you to see the difference between professional and amateur. Uh, so this is uh, the batch of tea I was stir frying earlier, but obviously I did not do all the fancy movements like that. Uh, so this is how the pearls do it. <laughs> Because poor leaves is relatively bigger, the step, the necessary step of rolling the tea, uh, other than just making it into a certain shape, is actually to um, break the surface membrane of the tea leaves. So there's actually uh, the extra juices, the flavor can come up to the surface. Uh, it's a very important step in the tea making because very well rolled tea will help to distribute the flavor of the tea equally among different brews. It's very much like kneading a dough. It's not as easy as it looks, actually. <laughs> See, we still have some sunlight. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be back overnight. And then uh, a little more tomorrow. This is the batch that's been drying since yesterday. Today it was a little sunnier earlier, but now it's a little less sun. Uh, the sun is not enough because it's raining. And uh, this will have to be laid out until, uh, until tomorrow. If tomorrow is sunny, we're probably going to get it done in the day. If it's not sunny, then uh, it will take a couple of days. You always, the, the tea that's sun dried in one day is always the most desirable.